Greetings, friends. Uh, the book I want to talk about briefly today is a book by Deva Nura Mahadev. The book is called The Long and the Short of It. That's the subtitle. The title is The RSS, The Long and the Short of It. It's a very small book, a short book. And this book was originally written in Canada, published in 2022. It has an introduction by Ramchandra Guha, the English translation, and an afterword by the Indian political scientist and activist and politician, Yogendra Yadav. It's published by Westland. This book became a bestseller in India, uh, although what counts for a bestseller in India is not quite the same as what counts for a bestseller in the United States or the United Kingdom and several other countries. But I know that it has sold tens of thousands of copies. Uh, its author is a very well-known figure in the Canada literary and intellectual scene. Uh, he's a person who uh, doesn't mince words. His literary output, though very small, nonetheless has been very influential, or so I am told, in Karnataka. And uh, this author uh, is a person clearly of considerable integrity because the subject matter of the book, as we know, is, a, is the RSS, and he is a person who takes on the subject without any hesitation. And he has done precisely the same in years past. So, as we know, there, the BJP has in, been in power for nearly 10 years uh, under Prime Minister Narendra Modi. And we know that a large number of writers in 2015 started to return some of the awards that had been conferred on them by the Indian government. Deva Naru Mahadev is one of those. He returned his Padma Shri and the Sahitya Academy Awards in 2015. And Yogendra Yadav in his afterword says, you cannot bend Deva Naru Mahadev, you cannot sweet talk him, even his critics do not point fingers at him. Integrity defines his life, his actions, his words. Now, this book itself is a book which, it's a very short work. It's really a political tract. I mean, it's probably, I suspect, not more than eight, ten thousand words. It's a work that looks at the mythology, if we can use that word, of the RSS. That's certainly the word that is used in the English translation. I have some reservations, as some of my listeners know, about using words such as mythology. Um, because there is a very rich world of mythology. But the point here is that this is a book that really looks at the kind of myth-making that the RSS has been involved in. Some of its insights are insights that we have from many other books that have been written on the RSS and on Hindu nationalism, particularly Hindu nationalism, in its most recent phase. But what really, I think, is distinctive about this book is the particular language that he deploys. Uh, and I suspect that the English here is trying to be faithful to the original Canada. Uh, as I mentioned, um, you know, I'm not someone who speaks or understands Canada. Uh, and in fact, the person who has provided the introduction to the book, Ramchandra Guha, who is, of course, one of the most well-known public figures uh, in India, uh, especially among what we might call the liberal slash you know, perhaps left uh, intelligentsia, uh, a liberal middle class. Uh, he himself does not uh, actually understand and speak Canada, uh, but it is very clear from the translation that an effort has been made to try to be faithful to the text. And that means that the English itself here is not simply very mellifluous. It is an English that 
conveys much of the folk language in which Mahadev often talks. Um, as an instance of that, uh, uh, we can look at, for example, uh, a passage that he has on Narendra Modi. I picked this particular passage because it is one of those passages with which I do not agree, although I agree with the fundamental thrust of this book. So here he is talking about um, uh, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi, and he says, this is the bottom of page 28, extending into 29, we should note another feature of party politics when it is regulated by an organization with scant regard for the Constitution. So one of his arguments is that the RSS, in fact, uh, is really anti-national, right? And I, and I use this, use this uh, word anti-national uh, with deliberation, uh, with some provocation, because we know, of course, uh, that the Hindutva uh, 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 ideologues and the millions of trolls they have who work on their behalf, they have used this phrase anti-national to cudgel people into submission, to browbeat them into submission. It has used this phrase anti-national to put down dissent. Anyone who says anything that isn't remotely unpleasant from the point of view of the government uh, is often castigated as anti-national, and we know that sometimes the consequences have been severe. There are people languishing in jail merely because they were described as anti-national. And one of the arguments of this book is that if anyone or any organization in India it is anti-national, it is certainly the RSS, because the RSS has absolutely no respect for the Constitution of India and for the values that are enshrined in the Constitution of India, including secularism, including the idea of equality. If RSS stands for anything, it is actually inequality. I think there's no question about that. And this author is absolutely correct when he says that the RSS has absolute contempt for the Constitution of India. It does not honor the national flag. It does not honor the national anthem. And so if we're going to speak of an, who's anti-national, it is the RSS that is anti-national, right? But let me go back to that passage where he then says, Prime Minister Modi, who won a majority for the BJP, is projected as a strong leader, but he is only an Utsav Murti, an Utsav Murti. Right? A replica of the temple deity taken out during a procession. Beautifully phrased. The real deity sits in Nagpur inside the RSS shrine. Right? And so this is where, as I said, I, I should also signal my disagreement with uh, at least this argument that Mahadev is making, because what he's really saying is <coughs> Modi is actually just a puppet. It's the RSS that plans and executes things. It's the RSS leaders, right, sitting in Nagpur. The real deity sits in Nagpur inside the RSS shrine. And he's referring, of course, to the ideologues of Hindutva, Golvalkar, Savarkar, Headgiver, right, Maharashtrian Brahmins, and why is it that I don't necessarily agree with him? I don't, because I'm certainly aware of the differences between the RSS and the BJP. And I know that the RSS has contempt for the BJP. The BJP are basically a party of banyas. And the RSS, of course, is the stalwarts of Hindu ideology, right? These Maharashtrian Brahmins and, and others who have joined the RSS over the years. Now, th that may be all true, but I think it is a mistake to, to describe Mr. Modi as simply a puppet, because I think that doesn't simply underestimate Modi substantially. It signals to me that there is no understanding of Modi the phenomenon, and Modi is a phenomenon unlike any other. We do not in India actually have a single book 
in my judgment, that has offered a really perceptive analysis of what makes this man, so to speak, work, right? Right? What is it that makes him so attractive, given the nature of the person, given how despicable some of his views are, given the fact that equality is complete anathema to him, com given that he has fostered hatred throughout the country, given that there are very few accomplishments that can be chalked up to his name or to BJP rule, given all of that, what kind of magic does he weave? And here, the word magic is a word that, in fact, the author uses apropos of the RSS. He says that the RSS is actually a magician. And, well, I think if anyone has been a magician in some sense of the term, it is certainly Mr. Modi. Right? Now, there are some very interesting things in this book. So he gives a history of the RSS very briefly. There are long quotations from the writings of Goldwalker, Savarkar, these two people in particular. And what he's trying to point out, of course, is, and this is, this is where some of those insights that he's providing are insights that have been given to us by a great many works. We know that, we know that Goldwalker, uh, especially uh, some of the other RSS ideologues, spoke very admiringly uh, of Hitler and the Nazis and pointed out that what was happening in Nazi Germany was something that India could learn from. Um, with regards to how obviously, right, it was going to, it could treat its own minorities at some point. But there are, it seems to me, uh, some very interesting things as well in this book. One of the things that the book seeks to highlight is the importance of the Manu Smriti for the ideologues of Hindutva, right? The Manu Smriti or the Manav Dharma Shastra, which is the other formal title by which the known as book in English. It has been translated several times, most recently by Patrick Olivell, although the first English translation, which may be still the one that is most wise, widely used by Bueller, appeared in the Sacred Books of the East. Uh, and this is a work that, as many people know, is a work uh, that is among the most important of the, the Dharma Shastras, the law books, uh, it is a mistake to suppose that it was the only book, the only law book, or that it was a most authoritative if one reads that massive, massive, magisterial authoritative compendium by P by Kane, uh, History of Dharma Shastra, published by the Bandarkar Oriental Research Institute uh, many decades ago, uh, running into seven, eight volumes. Uh, one gets a sense of uh, the, the, the much larger corpus of uh, law books, right? But the Manu Smriti has unquestionably been far more important, at least in recent years. And this goes back to the colonial period. The colonial regime had something to do with making Indians more aware, making Hindus more aware of this text. And it is during this period, in some respects, not entirely in some respects, that the work comes to have a singularity because to the extent that even Hindus are aware or any of, of any of the Dharma Shastras, it is only this particular Dharma Shastra that they're aware of. And here, this is, I know this is a cliched example, but let us cite it just to give an example of the kind of inequality that is obviously fundamental to this particular text. And the passage here that I'm, that I'm referring to is a passage where it is said very clearly that there are a class of people who are not fit to hear the Vedas, to hear the Vedas. But the Vedas are, the Vedas are meant to be heard, right? These are works of revelation, Shruti. And the Manusmriti says that the Dalits, the Shudras, it doesn't use the word Dalit, of course, the Shudras and women are among those who must not hear it, and if they hear the text, for example, surreptitiously, molten wax must be poured into the ear to block the ears, right? The text is rife with many instances of inequality, 
there are complexities to the text, but this particular talk is on this book rather than on the Manushastra. The author is scathing. He's scathing, for example, when he's referring to Goldwalker's um, bunch of thoughts, um, a collection uh, of some of uh, Goldwalker's observations. He says, really, without, um, uh, you know, without any hesitation, that this book is really completely misnamed because there's nothing even remotely resembling thought in this book. And I dare say that I have to agree with the author on this point as well, right? So this is a book which really goes over the RSS ideology. Uh, there, are, there are citations from various texts, but he also looks at the implications of the RSS ideology and the fondness for texts such as the Manu Smriti uh, in modern India. Uh, a very good instance of that is uh, an example. This is an example that he takes up. It's something that actually I am really quite familiar with, and that is the Karnataka protection of right to freedom of religion ordinance of 2022. Let's revisit this title once again. Karnataka protection of right to freedom of religion ordinance of 2022. And I can assure you, and this is what the author says, but I know this from my own reading, and I know this from similar pieces of legislation. In this case, it's an ordinance. In some states, it has not been an ordinance. That is something passed by executive order. It's actually been enacted by the legislature. So in some other states where similar bills were introduced or measures were introduced, Uttarakhand and Uttar Pradesh being two good examples of that. We have exactly the same wording almost and exactly the same implications. This legislation, protection of right to freedom, is anything but that. Because what is it? These pieces of legislation introduced in states such as Karnataka, Uttar Pradesh, Uttarakhand, are intended to prevent conversion, right? If a person wants to willingly exercise their right to freedom of religion, which includes the right to convert to another religion, and here I don't want to get into the debate because that is not crucial. I understand that it can be a relevant point in some context, and that is some of the circumstances under which conversions might be undertaken. But here the burden is on those who want to convert to prove, to prove that they were not seduced into converting, that they were not lured into converting, that they were not given material gain, that they were not promised material rewards, right? And one of the things that this text, one of this, this legislation does, it says that those who actually lure women, minors, Dalits and the mentally disabled, they shall be subject to a heavier penalty because there is a penalty for someone trying to suggest to someone else under false pretense that they should convert. And of course, uh, the question to ask is, why should this punishment be greater if the person who is being so lured is a woman, a minor, someone who's mentally disabled, right? A Dalit. And look at the list here, because of course the supposition is that all of these, including women, are weak. They can't exercise the faculty of reason. And what this person is saying, Devanura Mahadev, is you can see in these pieces of legislation the imprint of the Manu Smriti. It may not be anywhere mentioned, of course, and I think he is absolutely correct. It, so this is one of the many ways in which I think that this book is really, I would say, um, a really interesting read. It will take no more than three odd hours to read this book. And the author of this book, now this book was published uh, before the elections that took place in Karnataka a few months ago, which were, we know, keenly contested and which the BJP lost, 
right? Um, and and uh, uh, you know when we're when we're reading this book, we we have to bear in mind that he was writing, you know, before uh, the elections, and what he says here, this is page fifty four. He says the wisdom wisdom sorry the wisdom born from the experience of the countryside. That divisiveness is the devil. Oneness is good. Must become our wisdom too. And I concur with the author. I strongly recommend this book be read. And as I said, even though the book covers a terrain that is well known to scholars of India and to people who keep up with developments in India and who have some knowledge of the RSS, notwithstanding all of that, the book really has some new insights and it reads very well. Thank you.